Blessed is he. Who wants to be blessed? Who wants to live a life that's blessed? Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Oh. <laughs> blessed is he who is not offended because of me. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the challenge of living life unoffended. And also the challenge that, the, that God's Word calls us to, to not be the offender. This week, I want to talk about not allowing offense to take place between God and between us. Just as I've said before, few people want to admit when they're offended, right? We, we want to call it something else. We, we want to call it anything else. But I think that that denial is even greater when it comes to being offended by God. Because there is no Christian that wants to say, I'm offended by God. I, I'd rather use the word hurt. I'd rather use the word upset. Not mad, just upset. Whatever I want to do to try and soften it. I want people to think that I'm really offended by God or any. But all of that is, is encompassing of the idea of being offended by God. We have a difficulty admitting that we are hurt that we are angry, that we are even apathetic toward God. We will cut ourselves off emotionally at times. And sometimes that happens because somebody gives their life to Christ or even they have and they've rededicated themselves, whatever it might be. They get baptized, that sort of thing. And then in their mind, for some reason, they think they're taking this giant step of faith and that life is going to all of a sudden be great and all of their problems will be worked out and everything's going to be okay. And then they soon find out that as soon as you give your life to Christ and you do take that step of getting baptized, that you have, you, you're under a spiritual attack like never before that all sorts of crazy things start happening to you. And then if you're not careful, we've seen time and again, probably more than 50% of the people that have been baptized end up walking away in a few months because they had these expectations of what Jesus was going to do for them. Just hear that part. They had expectations of what Jesus was going to do for them which might have been the reason why they wanted to give their life to Christ in the first place. For some people, maybe it's because they feel like bad things have happened to them. And it's not just one bad thing, but bad things have continued to happen to them. It just seems like all around them, things are piling up time after time. There's bad things happening, and they never get a break. And so it, it creates this offense towards God. Sometimes it's simply because God's word goes against what you want in life right now. I've probably seen that more than anything. It goes against your lifestyle. It goes against your desires. It goes against what you're feeling at the moment, what, what you really want out of life. God's word is telling me that I'm not supposed to be doing something and my heart feels differently. God's word tells me that I shouldn't be doing something and yet I want to do this. And so what happens is eventually that conflict creates separation and we're offended at God because of his word. And we know what his word says and we know what the truth is, but we will keep shoving that away. We become apathetic toward God. We don't want, we separate ourselves so we don't have to feel the conviction. Sometimes it might just be because God doesn't answer your prayer. He didn't answer your prayer like you wanted him to answer it. He didn't answer your prayer when you wanted him to answer your prayer. You were praying for something that you wanted and God answered it the way he wanted. There's a number of reasons why people grow callous toward God over time. And then sometimes that callousness leads to a season that offense may even lead to pushing them away or they separate themselves for good. And now again this morning, as the last two weeks, you might be sitting here thinking of someone that you know that was hurt, that they were upset, that they were disappointed, that they were offended by God and they have walked away from the faith. 
And that's good in order to pray for that person. But we're not here this morning to hear a sermon for somebody else. We're here to hear a sermon for us. And what I want to talk about is you this morning. And when you feel offended at God. You know that Jesus has warned us that there will be many opportunities to be offended. And I believe that when he said those words, he wasn't just referring to being offended by somebody else. There will be many opportunities for us in life to be offended at God. And as we read at the beginning of this series in Matthew 24, Jesus shares with his disciples what the the end times, the signs of the time and the end of the age will look like. And he describes that. We started this whole series on offense in verse 10, where Jesus explains to them, all these natural disasters are going to take place, and then many will be offended. They will betray one another, and they will uh, hate one another. However, what I want us to see before we even get to that verse that led us to to not wanting to live a life of offense or being offended or being offenders is in verse 9. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Who is he talking to? Directly his disciples, but specifically to Christians. This is to you if you're a true follower of Christ. There will come a time where they will deliver you up to tribulation. They will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations, for my name's sake. Christians will be delivered up to tribulation, they will be killed, and they will be hated. Now, for those who believe that we live in the end times, and there's a lot of you here this morning, this is something that we should believe, if we believe we're in the end times, that we could face at some time in our lifetime. That the tables can turn quickly, And we don't know what tomorrow brings, but that there may be something that comes upon even where we live today that this may come to pass in our lifetime. And personally, I don't think the fact that we live in the United States will make a difference when it comes to God's word. Because God's word is true. And God's word doesn't say that you will be hated by every nation except if you live in the United States. You will be hated by every nation except the one that gives you the rights to free religion and freedom of speech. He doesn't say that that you will be hated by everybody and all these tribulations will come against everybody else, but you little pampered American Christians, because you had people that fought for you and died for you and gave you these rights, and you can stand up for those rights because you're a nation of the people. His word literally says, all nations will hate you. That includes the United States of America. We should never think that because we live where we live and we're blessed to live here, that God's word won't come to pass in our lives. There will be a time, even in America, where I believe that we will be considered the haters. That we will be considered uh, the people that the rest of the world hates because we are different, because we're separate, because we have certain beliefs, because we're not inclusive of everyone else, that that there will be lines that will be drawn. And the idea that we will go through tribulation, I want you to hear this, is that people around you, probably people that you know, they want to inflict pain upon you. That's the goal. That's what tribulation means. Tribulation means that you will go through painful circumstances. That means that you won't have rights. That means that it won't be fair for all those who are looking for fairness in life. It won't be fair. And it doesn't matter that it's not fair. It won't matter to them. And quite honestly, it doesn't matter to Jesus. Because the kingdom of God is not necessarily about fairness in life. It won't feel good emotionally, and it maybe won't feel good physically, because there may be abuse that's taking place. And the world's goal, if not your death, would be to humiliate you, to shame you, 
and to make life hell on earth for you. Now, we may think that sounds horrible, but we're not ignorant to the fact that this already takes place in other nations, to Christians, and other parts of the world. But my question to you this morning is if it happens to you, what will your response be? How will you respond when your rights are taken away, when it's not fair, when you're being humiliated, when you're being shamed, and essentially people are trying to make your life miserable? How will you respond when your life is so miserable that you can hardly bear it? Amen. Will you be one of the many that will be offended? Or will you heed the words of Jesus that led up to this description where he looks at his disciples and he prefaces everything he's about to say with these words, see that you are not troubled. Really? He starts with this, see that you are not troubled. Now here's everything that's going to happen. But don't forget, I don't want you to be troubled. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Most of us know that one of the main reasons that people walk away from their faith is because they are going through so many trials and tribulations in their life. And they, they begin to get offended by God because of all the things that they're going through. And then there's many people that might even sit here this morning and they think that it will never happen to them. They've been a Christian for too long. They've believed for too long that they have a, a strong enough faith that, you know, it's not ever going to happen. But the truth is, it has happened to people of greater faith. This morning, I want us to look at the context of today's intro verse in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 states this. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John, this is John the Baptist, not the apostle, disciple John, but when John the Baptist had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. He's literally quoting Old Testament scripture being fulfilled to John the Baptist. And then he includes this. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now, why would Jesus throw those words in with his response to the disciples of John the Baptist? Go and tell him this. Here's what's taking place. It's the fulfillment of Scripture. It's the fulfillment of the Messiah that is to come. And also tell him, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So listen, John the Baptist is in prison. Just get this in your mind. And he sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus if he is really the Messiah. Now here's what I want you to understand about John the Baptist this morning. Let's just take a look at his life. I got a lot of verses to read, but stick with me. Mark chapter 1 verse 4 says this about John the Baptist. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea, somebody say all. He had a very successful ministry serving God. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. I don't know about you, but if I'm preaching and everybody in the whole Silver Valley decided to come, get saved, get baptized, confess their sins, that, that would be a pretty cool thing. 
That might be even viewed as successful in the kingdom of God. This is taking place in John the Baptist's life, in his ministry. And he preached saying, saying this, There's, there comes one after me, like he understood this, who is mightier than I, whose sandal strapped, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's describing the one to come. John chapter 1, 15 says this about John the Baptist. He bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said when referring to Jesus who comes after me. So he sees Jesus and he's like, those things that I said that we just read about in Mark, this is the one, the one that I said that I'm not even worthy to, to strap up his sandals. This is the one, this was he of whom I said, he comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. So he understands who Jesus is, that he was before him, even though he was born after him, that he understands that he's the Messiah. Go down to verse 26 in John chapter one. And it says, John answered them saying this, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strapped I'm not worthy to lose. He repeats what he's said before, but this time it's in reference to Jesus being right there. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said in front of everybody, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. For I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. He's the whole purpose of who I am. He's the whole purpose of my ministry. He's the whole purpose of everything that I do. He's the whole purpose of everything that I preach. He's the whole purpose of everything that I have sacrificed for. He's the whole purpose of the life that I live. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This isn't just head knowledge. This isn't just fulfillment of scripture. This is experience. He hears from God. And he, he sees this take place when that happens. And verse 34, I have seen and testified. I have seen, I have experienced, I have testified that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said again, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is the Son of God. Upon reading like all of these verses, I think we would have to conclude, wouldn't we, that John the Baptist was a man of great faith. He had such great faith that in Mark chapter 11, right after the verses we read, Jesus actually proclaims this. He states about John the Baptist that no one greater had been born on the face of the earth in all of history than John the Baptist up to that point a tremendous man of faith, strong in his faith, bold in his faith, not afraid to call people out, not afraid to say it like it is, not afraid to speak the truth, confident in who he is in Jesus and in, in God and confident in who he believes Jesus to be, proclaiming to all those that would hear, all those within his voice, that Jesus is the one. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. Bold declarations to the world around him. But then, John is arrested. Now, we don't know some things. We don't know what jail conditions were like. It's believed that he was put in a cave. And we know from history that there was, you know, depths to the caves that, that were prisons and that the further back you go, the, the worst it was. We, we don't know if he was being fed properly or fed at all. We don't know if he was being physically abused. We don't know if, if they had given him the opportunity for a trial to actually see if what he had said was right or wrong according to the law or if 
he was in an unfair situation. We don't know what they, they thought about his rights and if he was able to contest those rights, stand up for those rights. We don't know what was actually taking place when it came to the accusations against him. We don't know if he would have had any inkling of what was about to happen to him. But here's what we do know. He had contact with his disciples still. And in his contact with his disciples, that he had heard about Jesus ministering amongst the people of Israel. We also know that that then caused him to send two of his disciples to Jesus to ask the question, are you actually the one? Or is there another one to come? Did John think that possibly he'd be around a lot longer because his ministry was so successful? Did he think because he was doing this great work of God that God would have protected him and that he would still be ministering out there in the, the, the Judean wilderness, that he would still be seeing the crowds come to him and, and he would still be preaching and he would still be baptizing and he would still see people confessing their sins? Did John think that if Jesus was really the Messiah, that Jesus would be advocating on his behalf? That Jesus would be doing something about this? That Jesus wouldn't stand for this evil? That Jesus would be protecting me right now? He would be fighting to get me out of jail? He would be standing for my rights? That he would be rallying up people to protest in the streets to get me released? Did he think that Jesus maybe would, would pull this miraculous jailbreak and that he would walk out of jail and be set free and he could stand next to Jesus and they could be ministering together? Or at a minimum, is it possible that he thought Jesus would have come to visit him when he was in jail? Like, I led the way for you. I prepared the people's hearts for you. I was positioned here by the same God. And now you're here. Like, you wouldn't even come visit me in jail? I don't know what was going through John's head, but I do know this, that there was troubles that he was facing. I don't know how he hurt. I don't know what questions went through his mind, but I do know that there was a difference in his faith. Pre-arrest versus pro-arrest, or past, post-arrest, not pro. It seems to me that he was no longer the confident and bold declarer of Jesus as the Messiah. But it's quite possible that he was once, that he's now doubting what he once taught what he wants believed. Jesus, are you the one? It can't happen to me. It won't happen to me. I would never let it happen to me. Those thoughts ever go through our minds? I won't walk away from God. I will go to my death following God. Never. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You ever have those bold declarations? I've thought those things before. And then when I do, it reminds me of another disciple of Jesus. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. It says, the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Some of you may not know he's talking to Peter. He's about to give Peter his name, but pre-Peter's name being Peter, his name was Simon. And so he says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, which means that Simon Peter is going to leave him. And Jesus knows he will leave him. 
But he also knows this, that there will be a return. And he says, when you do return, I don't want you to sit in the pews for the next year. I don't want you to just, just patty cake service and sing the songs and hear good sermons. Here's what I expect of you. When you return, I want you to strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. No, me never. Never will it happen. And then the trials come. And then the shaking starts. And the sifting is happening. And in the process, what happens to you? God, why? Why is this happening to me? God, where are you? And you're praying and you're not getting answers. And the question in all of that is with whatever it is that, that you've been through, whatever it is that you might go through in life, is will you be troubled or not be troubled? Will you be offended or will you be blessed? Blessed is he that is not offended by me. Will you be bitter or will you be better? And I want to add to that this morning. Will you be Judas or will you be Peter? Because when it comes to those two followers of Jesus, we need to understand that no matter what we know in the end happened to Judas, for those of you who know his story, is that both were followers of Jesus. Both of them served in ministry. Both of them were given power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. To send, They were sent out to preach the kingdom of God. And both of them returned back amazed at the power of God and the authority that was going through them. Like, forget what you know about Judas at the end. He was one of those twelve. He was one of them that was sent out with every single one of them. He was one of them that saw the, the miraculous from God taking place in his life. He was one of them that returned and he was jacked because he saw God moving through him. Judas was one of them. He served alongside Peter. Both walked with Jesus. Both talked with Jesus. Both knew Jesus. Both would face troubles. Both would be, would be sifted and shaken. But only one would return. So what is the difference between Judas and Peter? Here's what I can tell you about Judas's life. Is number one, when it comes to Judas, Jesus didn't meet Judas's expectations. Realistically, Judas had different expectations of Jesus than the rest of the disciples. Judas joined the following of Jesus because he believed that Jesus would become the king of Israel, that he would lead a revolution, that there would be a rebellion against the wickedness of that liberal government and all the things they're trying to do to us and all the perversions that are taking place, that we will stand up, that we will fight for our rights, that we will, we will walk in God's way and we will lead God's truth to overcome this nation, that Jesus will be the one that leads us into that. And he fully had this expectation that that's what they were going to do, that's what they were going to accomplish, and that Jesus was going to be the one with the sword that would guide them to victory because this is what God's word promised his people. And when he saw that Jesus was actually leading them to act a different way, to be a different way, he was really disappointed when things started turning against them. It's not what I expected. What are your expectations of Jesus? 
What are you expecting him to do for you? See, Judas, because of expectations, became critical of the ways of Jesus. He didn't like Jesus' ways. Give you the example of, you know, the story of the woman that broke the bottle of perfume and poured it out over Jesus to anoint him before he would go to the cross. And that when that bottle was broken, it was said of that bottle that it was worth a year's wages. And Jesus accepted that anointing. He praised the woman. But Judas, Judas' response was disgust. Like that bottle was so expensive, we could have sold it. If you really care about the poor, we could have sold it, raised money, and given that money to the poor. He didn't agree with Jesus' way. He didn't agree with what he saw taking place in the Christian life. There's got to be a different way. There's got to be a, a better way. And he became critical. And how often do we become critical of Jesus' way when we want to live another way? It's so easy like to sit back there and just think, you know what, this is the way I'm going to live my life. I've chosen to do this. And then some people still come to church. And they're some of the most critical people of the church of, of the, the, the singing or the sermon or of other people in the church, and they just want to, to knock them and put them down to make themselves feel better. And the truth is they're critical because they've chosen to live their own way. They're, they have chosen to separate themselves and be offended at God's word and at God's way. And, and in their criticalness, they're reflecting this offense. And it's not offense at the church. It's not an offense at people. It's not an offense at other Christians. It's an offense at Christ. We know that Judas served God, but we also know that Judas served God for selfish purposes. It says that, that he served Jesus and he was the treasurer and that he stole from the treasury for his own purpose. Now, I'm not saying that that any of us would sit here and steal from the treasury, but what I am saying that is that we do serve for selfish purposes at times. If we're not careful, we got to check our hearts on why we serve. Because there's times where serving God is fulfilling our selfish need. It's making me feel good about myself. Other people like me. Other people praise me. Other people look to me. Other people, other people, other people. This is, this is feeding the need inside of me by serving God. And when that's taken away, then their faith is taken away. Judas also knew that he did wrong. We see that he's sorrowful in the end. But in knowing that he did wrong and he had regret for his past, it wasn't enough to change his future. He obviously didn't know Jesus well enough to know about the forgiveness of Jesus. Now, I believe that Jesus summarized the heart of Judas when he tells the story of the parable of the sower. You can look in Mark chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. He says, these likewise are the ones, when he's talking about the seed that was sown, uh, and then the birds came and pecked it, Satan steals that away. And then he, he's talking about seed that's sown on stony ground who when they hear the word, they immediately receive God's word with gladness. When they hear, hear the preaching, when they hear God's word coming to them, they're the ones that are excited. They're the ones that are jacked. Often they're the ones that are making the most noise. They're the ones that are on fire when they're on fire. They're the ones that, that reflect like, you know, there's just such goodness in God. Like, like this is all amazing stuff. They receive it with gladness and it moves them emotionally. But it says this, they have no root in themselves. And so here's what happens. They only endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation, when hard times, when things get a little bit difficult, persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. You know that word stumble? You remember it? That's the same word we've been talking about for the last two weeks. 
It just doesn't mean that they get tripped up. It means immediately they become offended. When Judas first heard the word, I have to believe that he was glad. It was the words of Jesus that drew him to Jesus. It was something that he thought he could align with in his beliefs. It was something that he, he wanted in his own life. And so this is what I want for, for me. This is what I want for my country. This is what I want for my people. This is, this is the revolution. I love what Jesus is teaching. He's the one. I'm going to join with him because Jesus' way at that time matched his way. It matches the direction I think I want to go. It matches who I think I want to be. And so he was looking for something that would fit his belief and his way. And as long as Jesus's way matched what he wanted for his own life, then he was good with it. He was glad when Jesus would give him power and authority. I can imagine the amazement as the disciples come back at what took place. And Judas was a part of that. He was glad when he received God's word. He was glad when he was experiencing cool things. This is so cool. Like I hear this, this, this teaching and this preaching and then we go out and we see these amazing things. It feels good. It feeds the ego. We can be somebody when this whole king thing comes to pass. However, as time goes on and more troubles happen, when people began to actually walk away and traveling with Jesus becomes a little bit more difficult in life, Judas stumbled. Again, the word, he became offended. And he became offended because the truth is he had no real root in himself. There was no foundation of Christ inside of him. Now, if you look at Peter's life, Peter's very similar. When I think of people that get jacked and excited over God's word and they're up and they're down a little bit and then they're up and they get scolded and then they're down and then they're up, that's Peter. So like what keeps him? What keeps him in the faith? I got two points. They're going to be short. Then we're going to end this morning. Number one is I believe that what keeps somebody when they go through those times is revelatory knowledge. Revelatory knowledge. Peter had a revelatory root inside of him. And that created a foundation with Christ. And where do I get this idea? Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he asks them this question. All of his disciples are there. And he's like, who do they say that I am? Well, it's easy to say what other people believe about God. Right? Right? Oh, they say this, and they say that, and they say that you're Elijah the prophet, and they say that you're Jeremiah, or they, they say that you're all of these great people in the Bible. And so all of the disciples are piping off saying what other people say, and then Jesus makes it personal. And he says, but who do you say that I am? You don't see anybody else respond out of all of the disciples but one. Only one has the boldness. It's so easy to say what other people believe. But what do you believe? It's so easy to think you know what somebody else believes. But what do you believe? And Peter responds. And he says, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. And Jesus responds to Peter and he says these words that this revelation did not come through your, your flesh and blood. It didn't come through your own knowledge. It didn't come through your studying of God's word. It didn't come from the sermons that you've been he hearing. It came from my Father in heaven. It was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. In heaven. Revelatory knowledge is when you know that you know. Now, this revelatory knowledge would set the tone for everything else that Peter did. 
In John chapter 6, Jesus, he invites his followers to join this vampire cannibalism cult. Like all of you that have been following me, here's what this is really about. I'm so excited to tell you this. I'm so thankful that we've gathered here today. This is what my ministry is about. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life and I'll raise him up at the last day. I don't know about you, but I, if I was following a guy and listening to him and thought he was a really good speaker and preacher and the miraculous was taking place in his ministry, and one day he stands before me and he says, I want to tell you what this is really all about. All those things that you've been seeking after me for, they really mean nothing. Here's what I really want you to understand is that if you will eat my flesh and drink my blood, man, I'm going to bless you. Don't lie. You all would be like, yeah. Right? I mean, it sounds a little bit off. I, I have a feeling that it would create some sort of questioning, and it's worth questioning. And it says in verse 61 of John chapter 6, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, they didn't only question it, they were complaining to each other. I don't know what they're complaining about, but, but maybe they were looking at you like, Really? This is the kind of stuff that he's now going to start teaching us? Like, is, he, he really, like, is this really, you know, you see what's going on? Like, and, and they don't really fathom it. And so Jesus, he, he understands this. And he asks them the question, does this offend you? <laughs> Blessed are those who are not offended by me. It's so challenging, so difficult, so hard to understand that many of Jesus' followers thought they were being deceived, maybe even mistreated. Like, if this is God's way, then God's way is too much. They couldn't see the truth. It says in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus, he turns to the 12 and he's like, man, I'm so sorry that I said something so hard. Guys, I, I don't want you to follow after everybody else that just le left me. We had a really good ministry going on here and we were growing something big and successful and now it's dwindling down to just a few of you. Like, if I said something wrong, please forgive me. Maybe I need to give a better explanation of what I said, this, this vampirism and cannibalism. It, I'm not really talking about those things. It's just, you know, that there's something to do with blood and flesh, and I just really want you to get that and understand that, and, and, and it's not going to be as, as bad as you guys think. Just please, please stick with me, and we can make something out of this. No, that's not what Jesus said. He literally said to them, there goes everybody. You guys want to go too? They're all offended, and they're walking away. You guys want to join them? He didn't make it easier. He actually challenged them. But one disciple responds, and that one disciple is Simon Peter. And he looks at the Lord in that moment and he says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Here's what I want you to understand. All of the disciples, I believe, in that moment were questioning. Don't pretend that you wouldn't have questioned what Jesus just said. All of them were probably like, what does he mean by this? I'm not saying that they were questioning, you know, what they thought about Jesus. I, I believe that Simon Peter is being truthful here, but they're questioning what Jesus is really saying. Like, what is going on here? What are you saying? Why are you telling us this? Like, we don't understand. And then all the, then the complaining starts. And it maybe isn't necessarily like, you know, we don't want, you know, 
Jesus in, in any fashion, but like, why would he say something so hard and difficult to chase everybody off and now there's just a few of us left? Yeah, why did he say that? And I could see some complaining beginning to take place about what Jesus had said and why he said it. In that moment, despite the questions, despite not understanding, he's able to say these words. Where are we going to go? Even though I don't understand, you still have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That revelatory knowledge that God in heaven had given to him earlier in a time when everybody else is offended and walking away, in a time where people are questioning the why and, and what's the purpose of why what, what we're supposed to be doing if we're supposed to eat his flesh and drink his blood, like, like there's huge questions going on. In that time, he's still able to hold on to one thing. You know what? This I know, that you are the son of the living God. God's revealed truth in his heart. Trials and tribulations, they are going to come. And they will determine where you are spiritually. Trials and tribulations will determine where your heart really is. How you act under pressure is the real you. Now, we might want to excuse our actions under pressure, but the truth is it's under pressure that the true you is revealed. Do you have revelatory knowledge of who Jesus is in your own life? I can tell you this, that in my life, I, I look at them as stepping stones of faith. When I came out of college and I didn't believe in God, and then I began to be witnessed to by other Christians that I worked with, that I would went through a bunch of studying, and then I came across the book, The Case for Christ. And uh, you guys, most of you that have been here a while know that I read that book and I learned that there was a whole nother way, a whole nother uh, belief about Jesus. I had to ask the question, is there really a man that walked on the face of this earth named Jesus? And without dispute, I found out that there was. And then that led me to further studying. And you might say that that book changed my life, but it wasn't the book because there's a lot of people that can read a book and it not change their life. It was the revelation of who Christ is that changed my life. I can tell you there's been other revelatory moments in my life that I, would, I can hold on to. And those are my experiences with God. Knowing God's word and what it says and then seeing his word come to pass. Miraculous moments where my wife and I are crying out for something and then we see that come to pass in our life or we see it not come to pass and then later on we see the reason why it didn't come to pass. I can tell you revelation, revolution, revelationary moments where I felt like God spoke his word to me and then he wants me to share that with somebody else. And you take that nervous, scared step of faith and you begin to share that with somebody else and it transforms their life. And it wasn't just for them, it was for you because now I'm like, whoa. Amen. You can't take that away from me. Times where where God spoke to my heart and, and then he maybe spoke through somebody else and then to see those moments come to pass. And then you're like, this is crazy. You have that amazed moment that Jesus scolds because it shouldn't be crazy. It shouldn't be something that you're so amazed about. It should be normal Christian life that we, we seek the Lord to hear his word, not just written, but he speaks to you, whether it's through his living word or in his, his scriptures, or he speaks to you something that, that you just know that you know is God. And to say that, you know, some people would say, well, God's word will tell you everything that you need to know. It won't tell you who you need to marry. It won't tell you where you need to go to school or the next job that you should have. But God's word will give you answers to all of those things because his word is a living word. 
And when you see those things, the living word come to pass in your life, it creates these roots inside of you that build the foundation of Christ, that even when shaken, those things can't be shaken out of you. And even when you do walk away, like Peter walked away, that you know you're coming back. You have to work through some questions. You may have to work through some doubts. You may have to work through that hurt, but you know that you know who God is, and that doesn't change inside of you, and you know you're returning to Him, and that He's a forgiving God, and that when you come back, you're going to come back stronger, you're going to come back better, you're going to come back, and you're going to be able to strengthen the brethren like Peter was told to do. After Peter was sifted, it brought humility into his life. The one thing that allowed Satan to get into Peter's life to begin with was his pride. He needed to be humbled, and it was the sifting of Satan that humbled Peter. And yet when the tomb was found empty, even though John beat him, who was it that was running to the empty tomb? It was Peter. He knew who to turn to in the end. And even though he may have been battling the feeling of failure, he had some emotions he had to work through. He knew that Jesus was forgiving, unlike Judas. And Jesus forgave Peter. He restored him. Now that he had been shaken, he would be serving Jesus, not in pride, not out of selfish motives, but because he truly knew who Jesus was. He would become one of the boldest preachers of the good news in the early church. He would write two letters that we continue to study today. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, Peter writes these words to the church. First off, he has to tell the church to be sober. You would think you wouldn't have to say that. Even back in those days, they probably didn't have 5,000 different flavors. But he tells them, be sober, be vigilant. Pay attention because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings that you're going through right now, they are being experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I want you to understand that when we go through sufferings, there's somebody else in the world that's been through that same suffering. But may the God of all grace, who's called us to his eternal glory of Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, may he perfect, may he establish, may he strengthen, and may he settle you. Peter didn't write those words because he was studying the Old Testament, and he thought this would be a good thing to pass on to the new church that maybe doesn't know the Old Testament like I know the Old Testament. He doesn't write those out of his studying and his knowledge and put them in a letter to encourage somebody else. He didn't write that because he, he heard somebody else preach it and thought it might be a good thing to, to preach to other people. He didn't write those words because it was head knowledge that was inside of him. He didn't write those words because it would have been good knowledge to pass on to somebody else. He wrote those words because those are words that he had experienced in his own life. Satan wants to separate you with offense. Satan wants to separate you with tribulation, with trials. Satan wants to separate you with sickness and disease. Satan wants to separate you with strife and division. Satan wants to separate you. But Peter understood this, that it's through the suffering of Satan that God's grace can establish and strengthen you. Sometimes when we feel like we're under spiritual attack, what's our immediate response? 
Get you behind me, Satan. We got to cast this out of here. We got, got, got to get rid of this. Here's what I want you to just realize real quick as we're closing. When Jesus told Peter that Satan's coming to sift you, Jesus didn't pray to bind the enemy. He didn't cast him out. He didn't even ask for a hedge of protection to surround Peter. He didn't ask a bunch of the other disciples to, to start a prayer gathering so that we can pray for Peter. No corporate gathering of prayer to stop what Satan wants to do. But he prayed, prayed for Peter. And in his prayer, he said, you know what? Peter, you're going to go through this. My prayer is not that you get out of it, but that your faith will not fail as you go through it. What's our response in today's world? The enemy's attacking me. Will you come get a bunch of people and anoint me and pray for me? Can we do something about this? Let's bind the enemy. Let's cast out the devil. Let's pray for a hedge of protection. Or is it possible that our prayer is, you know what? I pray that your faith will be strengthened as you go through this. What the enemy means for evil, God will use for good. And that's my final point. God is good. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, again, Peter would write these words, Therefore rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Word of God. Like pure babies, crave God's Word as spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter experienced the goodness of God and by it he grew up in his salvation. Do you know that part of being sifted by Satan was the goodness of God in Peter's life? That the trials and the tribulations that Peter went through was the goodness of God in Peter's life. You know that as Peter boldly preached to uh, the new world at that time, that he would suffer persecution and tribulation that his rights would be stripped from him and that he would be put on the cross just like his Savior was. And through all of that, it was the goodness of God in his life. He writes to us, now that you've tasted, you've experienced God's goodness, you have to intimately know God's goodness and it will change your focus. It will change your perspective. And to do that, when you're going through all those times, you don't let the enemy attract you to the one thing that you don't have in life. The apple. You place your focus on all of the good things that you have in life. Knowing God is good will change your life. If there's one thing that's changed my life over my years of growing old as a Christian, it's this understanding. I've had that revelatory knowledge and I've come to understand no matter if it looks like hell on earth, God is still good no matter what. Doesn't matter if I understand it because I don't understand everything. Doesn't matter if I know why things happen because I don't know why everything happens like it does. It doesn't matter if I know the purpose of something because I don't know the purpose of some things, but I do know this one thing, that I have tasted of the goodness of God. 
And without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, beyond my understanding and comprehension, my wills, my ways, my hopes, I know that despite all of that, God is good. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. It's hard to be offended by God when you have revelatory knowledge of who he is and that he is always good. Father, I pray this morning that your word, that's the living word, sharper than a two-edged sword, is able to pierce the deepest parts of us. Lord, that it would prick our hearts in such a way that we would want to know the blessed life. Blessed is he who is not offended with me. Lord, I want to be blessed. I don't want to be offended. I want to walk in your peace. I don't want to be upset and angry all the time. Lord, that you would prick our hearts to crave your word, to be in your word. I want to know your word. I want to know your goodness. I want to know you. I want to experience the goodness of who you are in my life. Lord, I pray that you would make us aware of the enemy's traps, the bait of Satan that wants to trip us up and cause us to stumble as Christians. Lord, that we would recognize the enemy's traps, that we would not be hasty to respond or react to the things that are going on around us, but Lord, that we would trust in you and that that root that's inside of us would be rooted in your love for the world around us. In your love, they would know us by the love that you have placed inside of us.